purpose of our order. Our organization is known as the religious organization Tensei Shinbikai. The organization deifies and venerates the holy inscription of the Supreme God Miroku Omikami sama. Our founder and teacher is Mokichi Okada, who took on the name Meishu sama and is so known to his followers. Our organization aims to create paradise on earth. This means a world of people filled with happiness, a world full of truth, virtue, and beauty, health, wealth, and peace, a world devoid of falsehood, vice, and ugliness, disease, poverty, and conflict. It is a world where religion, science, and the arts exist in harmony, and where a highly advanced culture flourishes. With all barriers of conflict between different races, cultures, and nations removed, and all nations of the world integrated into one. In other words, our organization devotes itself to activities which will bring about the birth of the true civilization. In the culture which surrounds us today, falsehood, vice, and ugliness prevail without anything to hinder them. Troubles and obstacles, Disease, poverty, and conflict are daily realities, and so it cannot be the true civilization. The material aspect of our culture has become highly developed, but it never provides people with true happiness. The current culture is only a transitional one. The current culture even allows people to do harm without being aware of it, simply because they live in a more materially advanced society. We have sophisticated tools for shaping the world, while we ourselves are not yet mature enough to use them. Our culture at the moment is half barbaric and half civilized, but this is just a transitional phase on the path to a perfected form of development. This is why, no matter how far material culture develops, it will not free people from disease, poverty, conflict, crimes, and calamities. If the culture that has persisted until now is the old culture, humanity is surely crying out for a new culture to replace it. This change from old style to new style culture does not mean the development of a new set of tools, but a total transformation of the ordinary standards of human culture. It, therefore, must be accompanied by the birth of a new sense of values. It is at this very time. Now that material culture is fully established, that atheism should be revised by cultivation of theistic views. In this way, mental culture will be developed, and through this we can create a harmonious civilization where science and religion work together in balance. So we are now in that period when a distinctive new form of culture should be created. It is not enough merely to have a civilization attractive in form. That form should be imbued with a new soul to perfect a new age of true civilization. Simply put, the change from a culture oriented towards evil to a civilization oriented towards good is our utmost goal. In its efforts to achieve this, our organization is therefore not just a religion. On the contrary, religion is merely a part of our activities. Our organization should be regarded as a super religion, working to create the true civilization. We also aim to embody truth as the absolute and founding premise of the creation of paradise on earth and of a new civilization. Our teachings specify precise and detailed means, methods, plans, and designs to actualize paradise on earth. These teachings transcend and encompass all other religions. They can even be called super religion and are worthy of belief by the whole of humanity. Through these teachings, people can clearly distinguish truth and non truth. Moreover, the truth of these teachings is proved by the miracle of Jode. In this momentous process of transformation, the so called final judgment will be necessary. And only the fittest will survive. Thus, we will eventually show how, through God's grace, as many people as possible can be saved. Spirit leads and form follows. 
all material in the physical world consists of the invisible spirit and the visible form. All living creatures in the world are able to live because of the deep intertwining of spirit and form. This is called the law of unification of spirit and form. Furthermore, within all the activities of living creatures and inanimate material, spirit is prioritized and form is subordinated, and so spirit manipulates form. This is called the law of spirit leads and form follows. Spirit is the master of all material and phenomena, and when this law is understood properly, solutions can be found for all as yet unsolved problems. After death, the spirit departs from the unusable body and returns to the spiritual world, immediately beginning a new life in the spiritual world. When a spirit goes to live in the spiritual world, it first crosses over the river Styx to face the tribunal of Yama at the gates of the spiritual world. At the tribunal of Yama, the gods judge the spirits, and those spirits with the highest virtue go to Paradise, or Elysium, while those with the greatest sin fall into Hell. Spirits with a normal degree of virtue go to the intermediate state realm for spiritual practice, and this is in fact where most spirits go. Those who have been able to improve as a result of practice are then sent to heaven, while those who have not improved go to hell. The spiritual world has three vertical groups of layers, heaven, the intermediate state realm, and hell. Each of these groups is broadly divided into three, making a total of nine layers. Looking more closely, we see that each of the three groups is also more finely divided into 20 steps, making a total of 180 layers overall. I call this the world of spirit layers. Above all these layers resides the Supreme God, who commands and controls the whole universe. Different layers are characterized by different degrees of light and heat with heavenly upper layers having the strongest light and heat, and lower layers, or hell worlds, being pitch dark and devoid of heat. Intermediate state realms are like the visible and real world that we live in. The spiritual world is the world where everything exists strictly in harmony and fairness, with no discrimination between one another. Once the spirit enters the spiritual world, purification of all impurities begins, of course, the height at which an individual is allowed to live in the spiritual world and the length of the purification can vary from a few years to hundreds of years, depending on the amount of impurity in the individual. Once a certain level of purification has been achieved, that person is given life from God and is reborn. In the world of spirit layers, there is a seed for every single human being. I call this the soul seed. The soul seed is given orders from God and transmits the will of God through a spiritual connection linked to the living human's bodily soul. Each person's soul seed is constantly moving up and down the ladders of the spiritual world and can be attached to any of the 180 layers. Whichever layer the spirit is in, this is reflected in the life of the person in the physical world and determines the conditions of his life. The old saying, As you sow, so shall you reap, is an eternal truth. Good causes have good effects, and bad causes have bad effects. Therefore, understanding this law, and working for the happiness of others through virtuous deeds to elevate the degree of the soul seed in the spiritual world and to thicken the spiritual clothes, are prerequisites for making yourself happy. As stated above, the spiritual world and the invisible spirit which resides there are not just fairy tales. They really do exist. The causes of all problems, all diseases, poverty, and conflict are rooted in the spirit or the spiritual world. Therefore, it is vital that people learn about the spiritual world in this life and devote all their efforts in this direction. Unfortunately, modern science works in the opposite direction only studying the visible, physical world. 
This emphasis on the physical world explains why contemporary culture is based on materialism and is, therefore, not the product of a true civilization. We hope that the laws of the spiritual world will become the subject of the science of the future. These laws need to be understood by humanity as the true science, a science that goes beyond the scope of the material world. We hope this spiritual science will spread into the life and culture of humanity, for without it, a true civilization free from suffering cannot become a reality. In other words, we need to learn and understand the laws of unification of spirit with form, and spirit leads and form follows, and also lead our lives following these laws. This is more important than we can possibly imagine. Purification Action All things created by God have their dirt and impurities cleared away by a certain law of nature. Everything is endowed with the function to purify itself, and this function is called natural healing power. The process by which this natural healing power clears away dirt and impurities is called purification action. For humans, purification action manifests in the form of suffering, pain, and difficulties, and though these may be unpleasant, they are all intended to bring benefits to the person. Things will always be better after purification action. When a person understands the principle of purification action, he is already halfway to being saved. Applying this principle to our human body, we can say that purification action occurs in order to cleanse dirt and impurities which may have accumulated for various reasons. This action is what we call disease. The human body and mind that were contaminated through sins and medicinal toxins function in the same way as a trash incinerator, collecting the dirt and trash at one site for incineration. When those impurities are expelled from the body, the excretion system works, that is, cleansing starts to work. This cleansing, called purification action, entails some physical pain. This pain has been mistakenly regarded as the aggravated condition of the body and labeled disease. Originally, disease that arises naturally is the manifestation of purification action. But purification action includes not only disease. It can also occur through events such as house fires, injuries, theft, fraud, family misfortunes, business failures or poor profits, poverty, quarrels between man and wife, brother and sister, relatives, acquaintances, and so on. Destruction by wind, water, and pests are also examples of purification action occurring to improve things. The cause of the purification action lies in the evil thoughts and intentions, words and deeds of humans. In the spiritual world, these appear as clouds, which lead to pollution and dirt in this world. Disasters come solely to perform purification, and are, therefore, all due to the misconduct of humans. There are no natural disasters, only man-made disasters. To summarize, all the diseases, poverty, conflicts, and disasters suffered by humanity are caused by people's own thoughts, intentions, and deeds. It is, therefore, imperative that people make the utmost effort to avoid causing and accumulating clouds in the spiritual world. Clouds arise for two main reasons. 1. Evil thoughts, intentions, words, and deeds give rise to clouds in the spirit itself. 2. Medicine taken into the physical body creates impurities in the blood, which are then transposed onto the spiritual body to form clouds in accordance with the law of unification of spirit and form. If clouds are categorized into two types, inborn clouds and acquired clouds, firstly, inborn clouds come from four causes, the accumulated sins of human history through ignorance of God in one's past lives up to date, of the ancestors, of past lives, and of the congenital toxins in the physical body. The sin of human history is the sin of having lived for thousands of years in ignorance of God, doing as man pleased, and following pagan or atheist values contrary to God's law. 
the sins of the ancestors are the hereditary sins accumulated through crimes committed by generation after generation of ancestors. The sins of past lives are the sins which were not expiated in previous lives and have been carried over into this one. The sins of congenital toxins in the physical body are tenacious toxins that have solidified through the generations and appear as hereditary traits in the physical body. Acquired clouds are divided into four types. Clouds of evil intentions, words, and deeds. Clouds of medicinal toxins. Clouds of food toxins. And clouds of urine toxins. Evil intentions are crimes or injury directly resulting from the thoughts, words, and deeds of a person motivated by evils such as resentment, discontent, complaints, or malice. Medicinal toxins arise from taking medicines and traces of fertilizers into the body. Food toxins arise from food additives detrimental to health. Urine toxins come from residual urine resulting from poor kidney functioning, itself the result of medicinal toxins and food toxins. The congenital toxins in the physical body, together with medicinal toxins and urine toxins, are collectively called the three toxins and are the cause of all diseases. When the amount of clouds reaches a certain level, purification action occurs. If it is accompanied by physical pain, then, in the case of disease, there are two ways to stop this pain. One method is to remove all the toxins that need to be expelled so that none remain. This is done by purification action. The other method is to stop the purification action while it is in progress, returning the body to its condition before the pain began. This is suspension of purification. Purification action is stopped by slowing down a person's metabolism, and this is mainly achieved using medicine. At first glance, this appears to be an effective method, but it does not get at the root of the disease. Worse still, all the body's clouds must still be purified in the end, and from this broader perspective, it is a harmful method. As well as superstitions about medicine, there are other more serious superstitions relating to the stopping of purification action. There are superstitions regarding medical science, fertilizers, legal codes, education, and so on. These superstitions cause deep problems through the whole of people's lives and cultures, bringing about unpleasant and undesirable results which prevent a true civilization from being created. Purification action is a natural effect that occurs wherever clouds exist. Reducing the amount of clouds is the prerequisite to good fortune. There are three ways to refine and elevate the soul so that clouds are eliminated. The first is through austerities or the sufferings of disease or calamities. The second is through depending on God's reward for virtuous acts which benefit others. And the third is through contact with the arts and beauty. I am sure you will agree it is much easier to perform virtuous acts for others than to endure sufferings. Conversion of Night Era into Daylight Era In modern society, falsehood, vice, and ugliness prevail. People are surrounded by disease, poverty, and conflict. This is not what the true civilization is like. Our society has advanced considerably in terms of material development, making our lives richer, but real human happiness has not been realized. The present civilization should, therefore, be regarded as temporary and false, for it is a civilization in which material progress is given priority and even harmful acts are acceptable if they serve progress. In other words, we have developed advanced tools and technologies, but we ourselves as humans have not evolved accordingly. It is a semi-barbaric, semi-civilized world, merely a transitional stage in our evolution. If the present civilization is the civilization of the past, then we are now in need of a new, true civilization to replace the old one. This change from old to new cannot simply be a small-scale change involving the development of new technologies.
but instead requires the birth of a new set of values that will change human civilization at its roots. Next, I shall discuss the structure of the universe. The universe in which we live is made up of three spiritual elements, the fire element, the water element, and the earth element. The fire element is the spiritual energy emitted by the sun, the water element is the spiritual energy emitted by the moon, and the earth element is the spiritual energy of the earth. These three elements are absorbed into our bodies and our lives, giving them form and controlling them. The fire element is absorbed by the heart, the water element by the lungs, and the earth element by the stomach, and each of these elements has its own special function. Fire dissolves things and facilitates purification. Water hardens things and stops purification. Earth works to give physical form to the power of the fire and water elements. Now let me guide you to an understanding of conversion of night era into daylight era. In the middle of May 1931, our founder, Meishu-sama, received a divine sign that he should climb Mount Nokogiri in Chiba Prefecture, east of Tokyo. The following month, on June 15, 1931, Meishu-sama received divine revelations at the summit of the mountain. What was revealed came to be called Conversion of Night Era into Daylight Era. It was on this day that Meishu-sama gained new understanding into what was to become the core of his teachings. The essence of his realization was the fundamental idea that within the spiritual world, night era has begun to change into daylight era. If we look at the sky, we can understand distinctions of brightness and darkness in the form of day and night, just as we can see the difference between summer and winter over the period of a year. In the same way, dark and light alternate over periods of 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 years. We can easily recognize these bright and dark periods historically as periods of peace and war. Right at this moment, a long period of darkness is coming to an end, and we are at the dawn of another period of brightness. The night is ending and the sun has begun to rise. In other words, night era is converting into daylight era. This means that the water element emitted from the moon in night era decreases, and the fire element emitted from the sun in the daylight era increases. During an era centered on the water element, purification stops, and so goodness is rejected and evil goes unpunished. In such an era, evil fills the world and goodness is driven out. However, June 15, 1931, was the first day of a new age in which the spiritual world will become centered on the purifying fire element. From this day on, good and bad, right and wrong in the spiritual world will be clearly discriminated. Everything will be judged just as it should be. Good shall be seen as good, evil as evil. It will now be possible for a heavenly world full of truth, virtue, and beauty to appear on the earth, while the hellish world full of deceit, vice, and ugliness can come to an end. Furthermore, as the sun rises higher in the spiritual world, its light and heat will become stronger. Every year, when June 15th comes, the fire element will increase, allowing virtuous people to survive and prosper, while criminals and sinners receive ever more intense purification through disease and other sufferings. And as the daylight era progresses, fewer and fewer people will be able to endure such intense purification. This conversion of night era into daylight era is transposed onto the physical world so that the former non-discriminating form of salvation will be replaced with salvation based on the clear judgment of good and bad. As the old culture of night era collapses and the new culture of the daylight era emerges, we will see the birth of a new world based on a completely new sense of values. All humanity's cultural and intellectual products, including religion, science, politics, economy, and the arts, will be renewed and integrated into a new culture. As a result, 
people will live in safety, violence will be rejected, and a society based on rationality will be achieved. With the perfection of truth, virtue, and beauty on earth, falsehood, vice, and ugliness will be completely swept away, together with the problems of disease, poverty, and conflict, leaving a world filled with health, wealth, and peace. It will be a world without disease or the need for hospitals, a world without poverty or starvation, crimes, or the need for punishment, a world without wars, weapons, or armies. Finally, national borders will be lifted, all races, religions, and cultures will be valued equally, and the long-awaited world nation shall finally emerge. A true civilization shall be born, governed by virtue, combining the spiritual and physical in harmony. Thus, God's picture of the world will be perfected as paradise on earth. As stated above, a fundamental feature of the conversion of night era into daylight era is that through the increase in the fire element, good and bad will be clearly distinguished and judged. The fruits of good deeds are paradise on earth and a new civilization, while the fruits of bad deeds are the final judgment. When the amount of the fire element reaches its peak, the physical and spiritual body will be unable to bear even the most trivial or minor wrongdoings, and consequently the great purification action will take place throughout the world, leading to the deaths of countless numbers of people. Many religious men have foretold the coming of the final judgment, but this final judgment is nothing other than the great purification action sure to engulf all the people of the world as a result of the conversion of night era into daylight era. Meishu-sama became aware that his revelation of the conversion of night era into daylight era was the same as Jesus Christ's prophecy that heaven is close at hand and the final judgment. He saw that these were also the same as the Buddha's prophecy of the termination of the Buddha's reign and the coming of the world of the future Buddha Miroku. Meishu-sama also recognized that the time was approaching when all these prophecies would come true. This destruction and reconstruction is the true will of God, and Meishu-sama accepted his great mission to convey God's will to the whole world in order to save mankind from suffering and agony. Goshinsho and Jore. Goshinsho means the words of God, or Meishu Sama's teachings. After receiving the revelation of the conversion of night era into daylight era, Meishu Sama had the unshakable belief that he had been given the task of creating paradise on earth, and was the last man able to save mankind from the final judgment the last man able to realize the prophecies of the holy men of the past. He was thus given the greatest power by God to accomplish this mission. This power is the power to understand the truth and the power to prove the truth through miracles. The former power is demonstrated by his teachings, Goshinsho, which contain as many as 2,000 texts. The latter is the power of Jode, Jode is the rational and advanced science of the future. Jode is the method of radiating rays of spiritual light, the light of the fire element, towards the clouds in the spiritual body which are the very cause of disease and other sufferings. Thus, the root cause of suffering is swept away in the spiritual body before it can be transposed onto the physical body to bring about suffering in a visible way. Through the conversion of night era into daylight era in the spiritual world, the fire element will become more abundant, and everything will undergo purification action. However, within the individual, purification action can be facilitated by the power of Jode, which uses the special fire element to purify efficiently without pain, and is itself baptism by fire. Jode is the key method for creating a new civilization, a paradise on earth. This paradise has only become possible now that the conversion of night era into daylight era has begun, and Jode is the sole method for saving people from the great purification action that will engulf the world. 
It also has the power to reveal miracles so that people will be convinced that the time has come for such a world to be created. Through Meishu-sama, this is possible for the first time in human history. We spread truth to the world by the means of Goshinsho and prove the truth of Goshinsho by miracles occurring through Jode. In a nutshell, Jode is the only method for removing all human sufferings and for bringing about human happiness. The Meaning of Becoming a Member Now I shall explain the eternal credo, Tenkei Junpo Jode no Shime Kakuritsu, conform to the divine revelation and accomplish the mission of Jode organization. It is believed that during a period of intense spirituality, Meishu-sama received divine revelations at Mount Nokogiri in Chiba Prefecture on June 15, 1931. On this day, he gained new understanding into what was to become the core of his teachings. The essence of his realization was in the fundamental idea that the night era will change into the daylight era within the spiritual world. He believed that through this revelation, he had been entrusted by God to show the way to ensure the salvation of mankind and the creation of paradise on earth at the very time of the final judgment, the greatest transformation in human history. Junpo means to confirmly conform to something, and Tenkei Junpo means conform to the divine revelation, that is, to eternally and firmly conform to the mission that Meishu-sama became aware of through the revelation at Mount Nokogiri, or in other words, to accomplish the mission of Meishu-sama as one of the absolute followers of Meishu-sama. As stated above, Meishu-sama claimed that Jode is the sole and absolute way to accomplish his mission. Our organization's goal is to complete the mission that Meishu-sama could not accomplish during his lifetime, and thus we make the practice of Jode our supreme priority, putting into action our credo, accomplish the mission of Jode organization. We continue to spread the message of the importance and meaning of Jode to more and more people throughout the world. Becoming a member means receiving Ohikari-sama, the light which gives you the power to do all this, including the power to perform jode. It also means you join our members in making efforts to contribute to promoting happiness for the whole of humanity. This is done by participating in our activities through the organization in order to accomplish the mission of Meishu-sama. To confirm this, the following passage is included in the membership application form for admission to the organization. I shall pledge to make utmost efforts to correctly understand the Meishu Sama's mission, construction of paradise on earth, and creation of true civilization, and shall swear that I join in activities of your organization for salvation of mankind through Meishu Sama's teachings and Jode. I hereby would like to get my membership permitted. It is, of course, natural that people who wish to become members will pray to God in the hope that they will have their own problems solved and become happier themselves. Before that, however, we hope you need to understand and be convinced of the true purpose of our organization and the conditions to be saved, and then will become one of our members. Correct Faith There is correct faith and incorrect faith. Correct faith should accord with reason and should allow the actions and words of true faith to remain within the boundaries of common sense. The true purpose of religion is to fulfill God's mission, to seek for happiness of the whole of humanity beyond the boundaries of races, nations, and cultures, and thus all the miracles that occur are manifestations of God's support to those who are making their best and sincere efforts to follow His will. God is never pleased with personal entreaties or unrighteous wishes. Meishu-sama said the following on this subject, You cannot be truly happy without making others happier. Whatever austerities you endure at the personal level are just meaningless torment if they are not beneficial to society. 
true religion should base its principle on cosmopolitanism and transcend all differences of race, nation, religion, ideology, culture, and history, to preach love for humanity and for the world. This must also be put into practice. Faith should always be based on freedom. Freedom of faith should not be restricted, nor should faith coerce people into austerities or into following austere precepts and asceticism. If faith does this, and even goes as far as to preach that change to another faith is sinful, it is not a correct faith, but a hell-like one. A religion that uses whatever means it can do in order to accomplish its goal is not a good example. All the activities by people of faith should be based on reason when seen objectively. In addition, the deeds and words of true faith should be based on common sense. The purpose of religion is also to embody the truth, but believers are often dogmatic in their values and misuse their religion ceremonies, acting in ways far removed from common sense and unrealistic for daily life. This is a great mistake. One must also be cautious of those religions that advocate rituals of divine possession, make bizarre claims, or adopt strange practices. There are many people, however, who find value in such religions, and this is inevitable if people have little knowledge of spiritual matters. But caution is necessary, and people should similarly be wary of the kind of self-righteous faith that advocates kindness only to those within the same religious organization. In our organization, it is not necessary to believe and accept everything from the start, so please start from the things you can believe. But when you put into practice Meishu Sama's teachings, you must also take the utmost care not to infringe the basic freedoms of others, nor to force or urge others to accept your opinions, to be in conflict with medical science or other religions, nor to behave in ways which go against common sense. <laughs>